Hello, my name is Robert Diltz, and this tape is one in a series entitled Strategies of Genius. In this tape, we're going to be going inside of the mind and experience of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and exploring his strategies for composing music. I think that you'll find it's a wonderful and enlightening journey into the mind of one of history's greatest musical geniuses. I hope that you enjoy it. For over two centuries, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart has represented the pinnacle of musical genius. His abilities have seemed far above those of the average or even above average human being. Numerous anecdotes exist about Mozart's abilities and prowess. How he could play billiards and write down measures in between shots. How he wrote the overture to the opera Don Giovanni in two hours on the day of the performance. How he wrote down the fugue to a piece while he was composing the prelude how he was able to note from memory the entire miserere of the Sistine Chapel after only two hearings. Yet, according to the principles of neurolinguistic programming, Mozart's incredible abilities were not just some mystical, magical fluke, but rather the product of some very concrete and highly developed cognitive abilities that can be understood and even replicated by the average person. Using the modeling methods and distinctions of NLP, we can gain some new and practical insights into Mozart's exceptional strategies. One of the best insights into how Mozart's creative process functioned comes from a letter he wrote in 1789. In this letter, Mozart describes his strategy for composing music with impressive detail, outlining four basic stages in the composition process. He begins with the following description. When I am, as it were, completely myself, entirely alone and of good cheer, say traveling in a carriage, or walking after a good meal, or during the night when I cannot sleep, it is on such occasions that my ideas flow best and most abundantly. Whence and how they come I know not, nor can I force them. Those pleasures that please me I retain in memory, and am accustomed, as I have been told, to hum them to myself. Mozart starts by describing the psychological and emotional state from which his musical inspiration sprang. He begins by saying, when I am completely myself. Being completely oneself bespeaks some sort of internal harmony and congruence on an identity level. There's no inner conflict or confusion about who one is. Being entirely alone indicates that He's not in any immediate relationship with another person. He's free to have an uninterrupted relationship with his own inner world. Mozart also specifies being in a state of good cheer, that is, being in a positive feeling state. So Mozart identifies three psychological conditions, number one, being congruent, number two, in an undisturbed inner relationship with himself, and number three, being in a positive feeling state. He then identifies some physical conditions, giving examples of traveling in a carriage or walking after a meal. These seem to imply some type of physical motion. Mozart does not just sit and think. There's some kind of accompanying movement. Mozart continues by saying, it's on such occasions that my ideas flow best and most abundantly. It's important to note that he does not say, on such occasions, I make my best music. The term flow indicates that the ideas are arising naturally and without conscious control. It's almost as if he perceives his neurology as a kind of a musical instrument that plays itself, and that by adjusting his nervous system correctly, the music will come out on its own. Mozart seems to focus on setting up the psychological and physical conditions that will allow musical ideas to emerge spontaneously and automatically. Mozart points out that whence and how they come I know not, nor can I force them. This is clearly indicating that Mozart's creative process is largely unconscious and is a very systemic process rather than a direct cause and effect or a mechanical operation. Whatever conscious actions he does take do not cause or make musical notes appear in his mind in a linear fashion. Instead, Mozart's conscious actions adjust the state of his neurological and physical system so that musical ideas are released 
or allowed to emerge naturally. He then states that those pleasures that please me I retain in my memory. Here he's describing a very fundamental and important relationship between pleasure and memory. Pleasure in this case would undoubtedly relate to feelings. Memory would relate to the recollection of sounds. It would seem that on the micro level, Mozart's feelings form what is called a synesthesia with sound in a kind of self-reinforcing positive feedback loop. A synesthesia is an experience where somebody overlaps their senses, that is, where they hear feelings or see sounds. So the degree to which something feels pleasurable is the test in this positive feedback loop. The operation involves transforming body sensations into sounds through this process of synesthesia. Thus, Mozart's feelings generate internal representations of sound within his nervous system. The sounds that fit with the feelings of pleasure or that reinforce those feelings are naturally retained. Mozart's behavior and the quality of contact with his external environment stimulate or release internal auditory representations. The qualities of the auditory representations in turn stimulate or release feelings. If the feelings stimulated by the musical ideas fit with or enhance the congruent positive feeling state that he is in, they become strongly associated together. Mozart next says that he is accustomed, as I have been told, to hum them to myself. If the feeling that is triggered by his inner music resonates with the generative, positive feeling, then Mozart outputs that music by humming it. Humming involves another kind of combination of feeling and sound. Muscles in the throat and chest are activated to produce an externalized sound. The fact that Mozart mentions that he has been told that he hums is a clear indication that this is actually a process that he is not consciously aware of at the time he's doing it. In the language of NLP, we can outline the microstructure of this first, most basic stage of Mozart's strategy in the following manner. Mozart's composition process seems to begin from a positive, congruent, kinesthetic feeling state combined with some kind of physical movement. Internal feelings arise from the state which produce sounds or tones through a natural overlap between the kinesthetic and auditory senses. This linking is known as a synesthesia. If the sounds fit with or reinforce the positive feeling state, they are hummed and retained in memory. Otherwise, they're discarded. Once enough of the basic musical patterns are gathered together, Mozart proceeds to the next stage. He writes, If I continue in this way, it soon occurs to me how I may turn this or that morsel to account so as to make a good dish of it, that is to say, agreeably to the rules of counterpoint, to the peculiarities of the various instruments, etc. Mozart states, If I continue this way, it soon occurs to me how I might turn this or that morsel to account so as to make a good dish of it. The indication is that the sounds he has retained in memory form into larger chunks made of clusters or quote-unquote morsels. Once Mozart has gathered enough of these chunks, he jumps to another level of neurological organization in order to combine the bigger pieces together. He uses the analogy of making a dish out of them, a meal. While the reference to eating is clearly a metaphor, it's not out of the question to hypothesize that it might also indicate the inclusion of the senses of taste and smell into Mozart's creativity strategy via another synesthesia relationship. At this stage, Mozart has selected small groups of quote-unquote musical ideas through the feedback loop between feelings and sounds. When he has enough of these groups, when they've reached a kind of critical mass, he shifts to another level of organization, making a meal out of the morsels. To do this, he employs the rules of counterpoint, he says, and begins to take into account the peculiarities of various instruments. It is as if Mozart has to collect enough ideas together to reach a threshold where 
He can make a type of mental first draft of a composition before he can begin to apply these other filters. In the same way that a writer would make a first draft before applying the rules of spelling, grammar, and style. This new level of processing involves working with bigger chunks of information, and it would make sense that this necessitates the mobilization of other neurological systems than in his initial creative process. Mozart mentions applying the rules of counterpoint. Well, rule type thinking is most often associated with the left hemisphere of the brain, which processes logic and language and uh, rational thinking. Whereas the kind of unconscious associative process Mozart described in his initial creative activity would be connected to right hemisphere type of thinking. It seems reasonable to assume that at this stage then, Mozart begins to involve the more logical dominant hemisphere in his creativity strategy. His comment that, quote, it occurs to me how I might turn this morsel into account also implies um, perception, the perception on Mozart's part of his own conscious participation as a causal factor in the process at this point, which would be consistent with the involvement of the left hemisphere. Thus, while Mozart cannot force the original intuitive flow of musical ideas, he can consciously manipulate those ideas afterwards. It's important to remember that rules in and of themselves are only meaningful to a particular individual as the personal reference experiences upon which they're based. Mozart's use of the metaphor of creating a dish out of morsels suggests the possibility that he might literally involve the senses of taste and smell as the intuitive base for his understanding of the rules of counterpoint. It's intriguing to speculate that Mozart may have encoded the rules of counterpoint and the unique aspects of different musical instruments in the terms of tastes and smells, as opposed to abstract logical structures. There's a deep, natural intuition that we all have about how tastes and flavors fit together. You don't eat sherbet at the beginning of the meal. Its purpose is to balance out certain flavors. Quote unquote, tasteful music may actually require the sense of taste. One can imagine Mozart thinking, hmm, here's a sweet piece of music. Should it go with something bitter or something bland? In summary, at this phase of his composition strategy, Mozart is evaluating and working with the music on a larger level. He's taking his basic notes and melodies and combining and evaluating them in successively bigger chunks, as one might combine morsels of food into a dish. While his reference to the sense of taste through his analogy to food seems likely to be primarily for descriptive purposes, it may very well be that for Mozart, sounds also had a synesthesia overlap to the sense of taste. After this stage, the composition process continues at even larger chunks. Mozart writes, All this fires my soul, and provided I am not disturbed, my subject enlarges itself, becomes methodized and defined, and the whole, though it be long, stands almost complete and finished in my mind so that I can survey it like a fine picture or, or a beautiful statue at a glance. Nor do I hear it in my imagination the parts successively, but I hear them, as it were, all at once. What a delight this is, I cannot tell. All this inventing, this producing, takes place in a pleasing, lively dream. Still, the actual hearing of the tout ensemble is, after all, the best. Mozart claims, all this fires my soul. This implies something beyond the simple positive feeling state. This description implies the activation of much deeper and even more pervasive systems of neurology. It seems that as more and more uh, sound groups are pieced together, the positive feeling state grows bigger and more intense along with them through this synesthesia overlap process. It's as if at this stage, Mozart has reached a level of organization that requires the mobilization of neurology at an identity or even spiritual level as the level of organization of the musical composition grows successively more expansive. The commitment of neurology required to represent, retain, and manipulate the music also becomes more expansive. The feelings associated with this commitment of neurology would be quite deep indeed. Mozart writes that, quote, 
provided I am not disturbed, my subject enlarges itself. Once again, he does not say, I enlarge it. The implication is, I am the channel through which it is growing. It's as if the music is writing itself through some organic process of growth. Mozart continues by saying that the composition becomes methodized and defined, and the whole, though it might be long, stands almost complete and finished in my mind, so that I can survey it like a fine picture, a beautiful statue at a glance. This stage of Mozart's strategy is probably the most surprising and interesting. It is clear that a new sensory system has been activated, that of vision. This is Mozart's first reference to the visual representational system. Mozart is implying that an auditory to visual synesthesia has developed so that the combined sounds overlap to create a single constructed visual image representing the entire groups of sound blocks. This image does not appear to be in the form of musical notes, but rather something more abstract like a painting. It's relatively self-evident that each of the senses is able to process and represent information in a way that is unique from the others. Each sensory representational system has certain strengths in its ability to organize and evaluate our experience. Taste, for example, is really good at balancing things and putting them together. The visual representational system can hold many kinds of information together simultaneously in a way in which they don't interfere with each other. For instance, you can look at a whole group of people and see all of the individuals simultaneously without any interference by the sight of one individual or another. But if you listen to all those individuals talking at once, it would be overwhelming. The auditory system is not particularly good at holding a whole lot of things simultaneously. Its strengths are in sequencing, harmony, timing, rhythm, etc. So Mozart needs to mobilize his visual system at this stage. In doing so, he seems to be activating a very powerful synesthesia. He adds, nor do I hear in my imagination the parts successively, but I hear them all at once. It would appear that his image overlaps into the auditory system producing some sort of auditory gestalt for the entire composition. And as in the previous stages, these sounds overlap back onto the kinesthetic system as a positive reinforcement. He says, what a delight this is, I cannot tell. All this inventing is producing takes place in a pleasing, lively dream. Mozart's synesthesia patterns are so immediate and so unconscious that the whole process proceeds like a dream state, which also typically includes many synesthesias, by the way, and requires no conscious effort. Once the process is started, it mobilizes so much of the nervous system that it continues by itself without any need for conscious prompting. It starts to take on a life of its own, like a dream. This emphasizes the fact that it's the mental strategy that is the most important element of the creative ability, as opposed to the conscious effort or inspiration, even. Once a strategy has become completely installed and automated, the program can run on its own without conscious interference. Mozart gives further testament to the elegance of this unconscious mental circuitry when he writes, What has thus been produced I do not easily forget, and this is perhaps the best gift I have my divine maker to thank for. Mozart states that what has thus been produced I do not easily forget. Here Mozart refers to a celebrated auditory memory, indicating that it is primarily an inborn natural gift from his divine maker. Yet, if one takes into consideration all of the overlaps the music has made by this point with all the other senses during the three stages of the composing process, including constant connections to very positive feelings and onto the single visual image, and even potentially onto the sense of taste, it's not so surprising that these sounds would be difficult to forget. When something is hooked into other sensory representations, these connections leave their traces all over. It seems obvious that if you feel something, hear it, taste it, and see it, you probably have to work rather hard to forget it. If you're sensing it in every part of your neurology, where is it going to go? If you just hear it, it might be easy to forget. But when you have this incredible system of synesthesias, the music is so fully represented that it would seem to become almost holographic, so that every part of it contains every other part. Mozart describes the final stage of his creative process in the following way. 
When I proceed to write down my ideas, I take out of the bag of my memory, if I may use that phrase, what has previously been collected into it in the way I have mentioned. For this reason, the committing to paper is done quickly enough, for everything is, as I have said before, already finished, and it rarely differs on paper from what it was in my imagination. At this occupation, I can therefore suffer myself to be disturbed. For whatever may be going on around me, I write and even talk, but only of fowls and geese, or of Gretel and Babel, or some such matters. Mozart comments that when I proceed to write down my ideas, I take out of the bag of my memory what has previously been collected into it in the way I've mentioned. Evidently, he quote unquote collects musical ideas into the bag of his memory through the strategy of continually chunking up of using different parts of his nervous system to organize successively bigger and bigger chunks or clusters of internal representations of music. Specific sounds represent the relationship between clusters of body sensations that make up his feeling state. Rules, or potentially tastes, that is the morsels and dishes, represent the relationship between clusters of sounds. Vision represents the relationship between his musical morsels and dishes. He keeps shifting representational systems in order to organize successively larger clusters of representations. Because he is systematically chunked up in this way, retrieval is a function of simply reversing the process and chunking it back down. To get to the individual pieces again, Mozart just reverses the direction of the chunking process with which he organized the whole. He claims, quote, for this reason the committing to paper is done quickly enough, for it is already finished and it rarely differs in paper from what it was in my imagination, unquote. It's only at this final stage that the translation of the composition to the typical musical notes and symbols occurs. And since the gestalt is already there, this too does not require much effort. We could speculate that this translation to musical notation is probably a visual-to-visual -visual mapping, a, a correspondence between the abstract constructed image and remembered counterparts of the standard musical notation. If this is indeed the case, we can see how it would be possible for him to be making this translation while starting on another piece of music because the first couple stages of his composition strategy seem to require primarily kinesthetic and auditory senses, which are free to do something new while he's doing the visual-to-visual -visual mapping uh, to write the music. In fact, Mozart says, at this occupation, I can therefore suffer myself to be disturbed. Clearly then, this is a different process from the one that Mozart uses to create, in which he needs to be entirely alone. It requires much less of a commitment of neurology. He has one kind of picture and he's translating it into another kind of picture. As a result, his ears and his feelings and his tongue and his nose are free to do something else. When you think of how well he was able to sort out and employ his representational systems, it's not so surprising that he was able to be writing down one piece at the same time he was composing the next one. The visual system can be involved in writing down one composition while feelings and sounds are mobilized to start the next one. He says, I write and even talk, but only of fowls and geese or of Gretel or Barbel or some such matters. The implication of this would appear to be that if the subject becomes too engaging, he has to start to commit too much of his neurology to the conversation and it begins to impinge upon those natural circuits which have been devoted to the transcribing composition in his imagination. In summary, we can describe Mozart's creative process in terms of the interweaving of a micro-strategy and a macro-strategy. The micro-strategy has to do with the success of connecting together of the senses in synesthesias. And the macro strategy has to do with this chunking up process in order to encode larger and larger clusters of musical ideas. Each successively larger chunk involves the commitment of deeper and more pervasive neurological structures and seems to elevate the process to another neurological level. Once Mozart has reached the highest and widest level of chunking, seeing and hearing the whole composition before him as a single entity, he chunks it back down again until he reaches the level of individual notes.
We can outline Mozart's creative process through the following steps. One, the systemic interplay between Mozart's internal state, patterns of physical movement, and stimulation from his environment create the conditions in which musical chunks or ideas are generated or released. Mozart's internal state and the physical and environmental stimulation are encoded primarily in terms of feelings and movements. Musical ideas in the form of constructed auditory representations are produced through a process of synesthesia and filtered in relationship to their fit with pleasurable feelings. Number two, clusters of sounds and musical ideas, quote unquote morsels, are organized into larger structures, quote unquote dishes, by subjecting them to the rules of counterpoint and associating them with the peculiarities of various musical instruments. It's at this stage that the music is evaluated by filtering it in accordance with beliefs and values relating to musical structure and to quote-unquote taste, implying the activation of left hemisphere processes. The reference structures for the rules of counterpoint and the unique attributes of the various musical instruments are provided metaphorically and perhaps literally through the association of sound clusters with food and potentially qualities of taste and smell. Number three, the dish, begins to take on a life or identity of its own, transcending Mozart's sense of self and requiring no more conscious intervention. A completed whole emerges through a dreamlike state as a kind of vision that represents the gestalt of the entire composition. At this stage, the visual representation seems to play a key role. But synesthesias with feelings, like when Mozart says, all this fires my soul and what a delight it is, and with sounds, where he says, I can hear it all at once, these are essential to mobilize the neurology necessary to produce the gestalt. The fourth and final stage of writing down the composition is a function of reversing the chunking process and unfolding or decoding what has been enfolded or encoded together through the previous three stages. The transcription of the multisensory musical gestalt most likely occurs through the mapping of the elements of the abstract constructed visual image, what he called the, the painting or the statue, to the standard musical notational system held in memory. On the level of a meta-strategy, one of the most fascinating things about Mozart's process is the degree to which he so clearly distinguishes various stages and levels of creativity according to different senses and metaphors. For example, Mozart's reference to making a dish at the second stage of his musical composition process implies the microstrategy of taste and smell. But it also implies the use of a metaphor of a meal for musical composition as a macrostrategy. His reference to painting and sculpture at the third stage of his composition process not only indicates the addition of a different sense in the strategy, but the metaphor also introduces a different set of relationships at the level of macrostrategy. The kinds of relationships we pay attention to while appreciating a painting or a sculpture are different from those we notice while tasting or appreciating a dish or a meal. Thus, Mozart's choice of metaphors is not trivial. As a contrast, imagine if he had used the metaphor of seeing the whole composition as a well-built machine. If he said, I saw it before me like a well-made clock. The metaphor is as important as the sensory system being employed because it implies certain kinds of interrelationships. I once had the opportunity to listen to the performance of a mass composed by Mozart's father, Leopold Mozart, followed by Wolfgang Mozart's Requiem. There was really no comparison between the piece that Leopold Mozart wrote and his son's Requiem. Not that the elder Mozart's composition wasn't a nice piece. He was clearly familiar with all the mechanics of how to write music. But there wasn't the same kind of personality, complexity, nor richness in his mass that characterized his son's work. It was indeed m more like a well-made clock than a painting. Leopold's was technically flawless, but lacking the richness of identity and spirit of his son's requiem. You could tell that the younger Mozart's requiem was like a painting. The pieces of the composition fit together with a kind of non-linear coherence that a painting would have. Mozart's creativity strategy is more akin to the process people go through when they fall in love than the technical process of analysis and criticism. In fact, Mozart once described the meta-strategy for the whole of his creative process by stating, 
I'm constantly searching for two notes who love each other. Let's take a look at the similarity of Mozart's strategy to that of other musicians and composers. Mozart's not the only famous composer who described his process for creating music in these types of terms. Beethoven, for instance, used language remarkably similar to Mozart's in describing his own strategy for composing. He wrote, I begin to elaborate the work in its breadth, its narrowness, its height, and its depth. And since I'm aware of what I want to do, the underlying idea never deserts me. It rises, it grows. I hear and see the image in front of me from every angle as if it had been cast like a sculpture. And only the labor of writing it down remains. Amazingly, Beethoven's description echoes Mozart's in almost every key detail. He says the composition grows and it is heard and seen before him like a sculpture. And in the end, only the labor of writing it down remains. Similarly, composer Paul Hindemith maintained, A genuine creator will have the gift of seeing, illuminated in the mind's eye, as if by a flash of lightning, the complete musical form. He will have the energy, persistence, and skill to bring this envisioned form into existence, so that even after months of work, not one of its details will be lost or fail to fit into his photographic picture. Like Mozart, Hindemith refers to the vision of a complete musical form. Although he uses the analogy of a photographic picture as opposed to a painting or statue. Since photography did not exist in the times of Mozart or Beethoven, it's difficult to assess if the artistic implications of painting and sculpture are essential, or if Mozart and Beethoven would have shifted to more modern metaphors. What is clear is that the visual form of the music is not that of standard musical notation, but of a more abstract quality. Pulitzer Prize-winning symphony composer Michael Colgrass described the role these types of synesthesias and special imagery played in his creative process in the following way. Once you set up your idea of the material, you kind of sit back. You look at it, you think about it, and you feel it. And then, if you're sensitive to it, it starts to tell you what it wants to do. It's like it starts to move in a certain direction. If you're sensitive, you'll just kind of say, uh-huh, and you'll just start writing it down. When I'm like this, in an important moment, writing it down, I'm feeling it, I'm hearing it, and I'm seeing the mathematical subdivisions of the rhythms that have to be written down. Sometimes people say, how do you write pieces? And I'll say, I build them. You do write with a pencil. That's the mark you make. But you do build. You construct. And as these pieces start to go in, then they suggest other pieces. And a certain detachment begins to take place too. Because as you detach yourself, you're getting to a gestalt view of what's going on here, see? Because this piece is going to last 20 minutes, but you've got to be able to see it swoosh as finished. You've got to be able to see it from here to here. You can't sing through 20 minutes every time you want to check something at the 17th minute. So you've got to be able to go za like that and take in the emotional runnings, things, feelings, and events. Events and feelings that have to take place fast so that you can get to this point and not have to waste a lot of time. Now, these are amorphous images that I'm speaking of now, not the 8th notes or 16th notes or B-flats. It's like a kind of painting, but not exactly, and it's, it's an abstract image. Elements of Mozart's strategy appear to be important for almost all aspects of music, not simply creativity and composition. I once assisted in the study of the strategies of exceptional music students conducted at two of the most prestigious music schools in England. These students had demonstrated ability and skills such as memory for rhythm and pitch and chord discrimination tasks. Like Mozart, the exceptional students used a great deal of synesthesia, transforming sounds into feelings and imagery to represent the music as a whole. They would visualize sounds generally not as notes, but as shapes and colors, like abstract paintings, which they referred to as, quote, musical mappings or graphs. They were able to use this kind of abstract imagery to remember unusual or extended melodies and rhythms. It is interesting to note that Mozart's strategy is not limited to the composition of classical music either. Some of the most successful and prolific composers of modern popular music have also mentioned a dreamlike, largely unconscious quality 
as described by Mozart, as part of their creative process. For example, in an interview with Rolling Stone magazine in 1983, popular music composer and performer Michael Jackson reported, I wake up from dreams and go, wow, put this down on paper. You hear the words, everything is there in front of your face. That's why I hate to take credit for songs I've written. I feel that somewhere, someplace, it's been done and I'm just a courier bringing it into the world. Paul McCartney, another famous popular music composer, who's also written classical pieces, mentioned a similar experience in a television interview. He described how, when he was a member of the Beatles, he dreamt that he heard the Rolling Stones, a rival musical group, performing a song that he was quite jealous of. When he awoke, he realized that they had never actually recorded and performed the song that he had dreamt about, so he wrote it down and recorded it. It was one of the group's most successful hits, Yesterday. Key aspects of Mozart's strategy appear in the creative process of non-musicians. For instance, Albert Einstein's perception of the mathematical equations for representing his theories strongly echoes Mozart's description of the role of musical notation in his creative process. Einstein wrote, No really productive man thinks in such a paper fashion. The theory of relativity did not grow out of any manipulation of axioms. These thoughts did not come in any verbal formulation. I very rarely think in words at all. A thought comes and I may try to express it in words afterwards. The words or the language as they are written or spoken do not seem to play any role in my mechanism of thought. The psychical entities which seem to serve as elements in thought are certain signs or more or less clear images which can be voluntarily reproduced and combined. The above mentioned elements are in my case of visual and some of muscular type. Conventional words or other signs have to be sought for laboriously only in a second stage when the mentioned associative play is sufficiently established and can be reproduced at will. Perhaps the most important thing to be learned from Mozart's strategy in relationship to the process of composing, performing, and appreciating music is the significance of synesthesias between the senses and the constant anchoring of the whole process to positive feelings. The actual knowledge of musical notation only comes into play at the very end of the strategy. Yet, ironically, it is this knowledge that always seems to be taught to music students first, and unfortunately it's often done in a way that interferes with the connection of sound patterns to positive feelings and to creative synesthesias to the other senses. Perhaps if we revise the sequence and structures with which we teach music students in order to match the strategy of Mozart, we would have more potential Mozarts in the field of music today. One of the most valuable things about using NLP to model strategies such as Mozart's is that the basic form of the strategy may be transferred to other areas than those for which it was initially developed. For instance, Mozart's strategy has interesting applications beyond music. It's essentially a strategy for applying the natural self-organizing capabilities of our nervous system to systematically represent and organize complex patterns of interaction. On its most fundamental level, Mozart's strategy mobilizes vast amounts of neurology and stimulates unconscious processing. This can be extremely valuable for any number of applications involving creativity or problem solving. Many people listen to music when they're working on a problem. It's quite possible that on a physiological level, music even activates neural circuits that become available to facilitate or participate in creativity or problem solving. It's even quite possible that Mozart himself, as has been suggested by some of his biographers, worked out his personal problems through his music. Certainly, many people use music as a stimulus and a metaphor to help them with problem solving. For instance, I know of a chief executive officer of one of the largest automobile manufacturers in Europe who had two hobbies, neurophysiology and music. Whenever he was confronted with a difficult organizational problem, he would create a metaphor for the problem in terms of these two fields. For example, he might think of people as notes, teams as chords, projects as musical pieces. Then he would try to hear the problem in terms of the music. Were there discordant notes? Were the two chords in harmony? And so on. One formulation of Mozart's strategy into a more general method for involving unconscious processes and stimulating lateral thinking during creativity and problem solving could be stated as follows. 1. Think of a problem that you're trying to solve or an outcome that you want to achieve. 
Introspectively pay attention to how you're currently thinking and feeling about the problem or outcome and which choices you perceive available to you. Number two, put yourself into a positive feeling that represents your desired state for the issue that you're working with. Three, allow that feeling to transform into sounds that fit with or enhance this desired state feeling. Number four, hear the problem as a kind of sound. It may initially interfere with this desired state music. Five, allow the sounds representing the desired state and the problem to transform into tastes and smells that you might associate with food. Six, find counterpoints for the problem sounds and tastes, i.e., the sounds and tastes from the desired state music and flavors that balance and offset the problem sounds. Seven, make the sounds and tastes into imagery. Use shape, color, brightness, etc. And see how they interact as a whole. Allow the image to form an abstract representation that metaphorically embodies a solution to the problem. Eight, return to your typical conscious thinking process in relation to the problem and notice how it's changed. One way to apply this creativity and problem-solving strategy of Mozart would be in the form of a meditation. This helps to enhance the spontaneous and dreamlike quality described by Mozart. I've often applied Mozart's strategy in this way to my own work in the areas of creativity and health. The following is an example of a guided meditation for creativity based on Mozart's process. Take a moment and relax. Put your body in a balanced and symmetrical posture. As Mozart said, be completely yourself. For a moment, you don't have to worry about anything or anybody else. You can just be alone with yourself. Allow your attention to focus on an outcome you'd like to achieve or a problem that you're trying to solve. As you do, focus on your desired state. What would you really like to get from solving that problem or reaching that goal? What is it that seems to draw you towards it as you imagine resolving this issue? Begin to fully sense and feel the positive desired effects and benefits that you'd like to achieve. As you become strongly in touch with your desired state, be aware of what's going on inside of you. Notice how these positive feelings affect your inner body sensations and your physiology. When you really experience this good feeling, does it change your breathing? In what way does it affect your posture? Is there a kind of feeling of circulation or warmth? What kind of subtle movements are you aware of? Allow your body to move with the sensations that you feel, solidifying and exaggerating them. Now, imagine that each part of your body was a type of musical instrument that could make a different kind of sound. Imagine that your heart could make a certain kind of sounds and your lungs another. Fantasize that the muscles in your shoulders, your tongue, your hands, your stomach, your throat, your eyes and your spine are each musical instruments that make their own special kinds of sounds. And as you experience that special feeling associated with your desired state, listen to which of these instruments are involved in producing that feeling. What sounds do they each generate as they create this positive feeling? What kind of inner sounds come from your heart, your brain, your stomach? Is there a certain rhythm to this feeling? Is it fast or slow? Is it high-pitched? Are there some parts of your body's inner musical instruments that play louder? Perhaps your heart plays a little bit louder than your throat. Just listen to your body. Listen to the natural music that's already there. The kind of music that expresses this special feeling in the relationship with which it is associated. Gently play with the sounds and tones and melodies that begin to arise from your body now and notice what kinds of sounds deepen the feeling that you have. What kind of inner music seems to fit with and expand that positive inner feeling? 
as you let your body's music continue to build, begin to imagine that these sounds and this music could become tastes and smells. As you hear the music coming from your heart, from your lungs, from your stomach, realize that you can smell it and taste it as well. As you inhale, act as if you could breathe in that special sensation and not only hear it and feel it, but taste what's so special about it. What does it smell like? What does it taste like? Is it kind of bittersweet or light or fluffy? Perhaps it tastes like a very old and well-aged wine. How could you make a meal out of it, a movable feast? Savor and cherish the tastes and smells that go with this feeling and with this inner music. As your body continues to move in rhythm with that feeling and the sounds circulate in your inner ears and the tastes really come alive on your tongue like the best meal that you've ever eaten, perhaps these tastes can almost begin to explode into colors and into vision so that you can see this feeling, these sounds, these exquisite tastes and flavors that represent the most positive qualities of that desired state. You can almost see a painting of light dazzling and dancing with colors that really represent and deepen that feeling and those sounds and those tastes all together. The vibrancy of the colors and shapes that you see can deepen the taste and feeling. The image spreads before you like a beautiful landscape and allows you to taste even more richly and hear even more concretely and feel your desired state even more fully so that all of your inner senses are alive with this feeling. Your breathing expresses it, your heart expresses it, your entire neurology expresses it. It's like a hologram of the senses that imprints that experience deeply within you. Now begin to listen for any problems or interferences to reaching your desired state or solution. At first they may sound rough or discordant, but as you continue to listen, you can hear, feel, taste, or see the ways in which to incorporate, balance, transform or absorb any unpleasant sounds into the powerful beauty of your internal music. If you want, you can allow resources and solutions in the form of other types of songs and music. Perhaps you can even hear some of Mozart's music gently drifting in and out as a guiding inspiration. Imagine that your inner music is a kind of holographic resource, a resource in which all other resources are contained. From it, Confidence, capabilities, and solutions seem to flow easily and naturally. As you feel, listen, taste, and watch, many new choices and alternatives begin to open to you, even if you're not consciously aware of them at this time. You can trust that they will be available in the bag of your memory when you need them. And then, think of what kind of unique way you could tangibly embody that hologram of resources and solutions. If you don't consciously know what they will be in reality yet, you can express them in the form of a symbol, metaphor, or music, as Mozart did. Maybe you would express it through a drawing, or a dance, or a poem. Perhaps you would simply express it with a particular posture of your body, or a look in your eyes. What is something that you could physically make that would express this positive feeling? What song might you sing? What drawing could you make? What is something that would come out of your own hands or your own mouth or your own neurology that would represent your desired state? Allow the natural and powerful self-organizing capabilities of your nervous system to dream something up. Let it happen as if it were some pleasing, lively dream. Perhaps even in your dreams tonight some of the elements of the special feelings, sounds, tastes, or vision could be there and continue to bloom whether you're consciously thinking about them or not. Even as you begin to become consciously aware of the room around you, this dream can continue in the back of your mind. Feel the parts of your body touching the chair or the floor and hear the sounds drifting through the air surrounding you and open your eyes to see the concrete objects before you. Yet in some way, the elements of this inner sensory hologram can be reflected back to you from your external reality. Realize that you actually sense parts of that music and that dream in everyday experience. 
Maybe at your meal tonight you will suddenly taste something that reminds you of your inner feast. Perhaps in the eyes or the voice or the movements of somebody that you're with, you'll be able to see your vision or hear your music. Most importantly, manifest and embody it through your own creations and actions. For the actual hearing of the tout ensemble is, after all, the best. Like the music he generated with it, Mozart's strategy is full of the organic richness of life. Our knowledge of its structure can not only offer fresh insights into his creations, but it can help to enhance the skill and appreciation of musicians and late musicians, young and old. Ultimately, it can offer guidance in how to utilize all levels of our neurology, mobilizing intuition and unconscious abilities as well as conscious skill.